There, I can be more comfortable. Glad that you're here this morning to hear this message today. You can probably add this to that category list of messages, things I would not have chosen to preach in a vacuum. You know, if I was just going through text or if I was just sitting there in my study trying to think, what are some things I might want to talk about in 2023? I know, let me hit this one. It probably wouldn't be in the top of the list. But I want to give an advertisement for the concept of expository preaching because this is why we do what we do like we do the word. It's important for us to hear all of it and to recognize that everything that God has given to us is good because God is good. His word is good. His truth is good. So I want to take this tact this morning. I want to simply delve into the text. I'm going to start by reading it. I want to share some presuppositions about our handling of it. And then I want to pray about our response to it. So let's do that together this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 9. Likewise also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with that what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So let's start with some presuppositions. What do we believe is a foundation as we address the content of that text that I just read? Let's start here, and I think this is critical. Number one, this passage is a message from God. Don't forget that. This passage is a message from God. Paul writes to, to Timothy in, in the second letter, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is breathed out by God, all of it. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's all profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Everything that God has given in his word, all of it, the parts that are obvious in their weightiness and value, and the parts that are less so are still good, and they're still profitable. They're still useful for God's purposes in shaping us to completeness. The scriptures, rightly understood and applied, make us mature in Christ. That's what this passage is about. It's all from God, which means, and this is critical for our understanding of it as a starting point, this is not just an apostle's opinion. As prominent as he was, as influential as he was, as much sway as he had over the people, this is not just the Apostle Paul saying, hey guys, here's what I think. This is God's word. People have been pitting the Apostle Paul versus Jesus since the Enlightenment. And to do so shows a critical flaw in how we understand Scripture. Paul, Roger Olson professor at Baylor University, writes this. He says, every Christian I have ever met who pits Paul against Jesus and Jesus against Paul, for example, Paul was a misogynist, but Jesus was a liberator of women, went on, when pressed, to disagree with Jesus too. And that's because Jesus says some pretty hard things for liberal or progressive Christians to accept. So maybe you, like other people, have heard someone say something like this. Uh, I don't care really what Paul says, not me, this guy. I don't care what the Apostle Paul says. I just want to follow Jesus. Who, who cares what Paul said? I, I just care about what Jesus said. And you may even hear a reference to this. They'll call this attitude red-letter Christianity. How many of you have uh, maybe a King James Bible there and you've had it for some time and when you open it up, you've got certain words that are written in red. Those words that we suppose were said by Jesus himself. And somehow in our mindset, we've begun to think, I'm afraid, if not consciously, at least subconsciously, that the red words are more of God and therefore more important, more necessary than the, than the black words. There are all kinds of problems with this tension, this division, trying to put Paul and Jesus at odds with one another. And these are just a few. First one is clear. Everything that we know about Jesus comes from the Bible. To say that, well, Jesus was this, but Paul says this, really is incoherent when it comes to interpreting the scriptures. Everything you know about Jesus comes from the New Testament. Paul was the first writer of the New Testament. In, in fact, most of Paul's letters were written before any of the Gospels were written. Just because you have them in this order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts, 
doesn't mean that's the chronological order of those things. Paul wrote his letters, and they were circulating before we even had the gospel accounts. The whole New Testament is traditional, classical Christianity's highest authority for faith and practice. No part of it should be dismissed as irrelevant or unimportant or not applicable to us today. None of it should be vilified or considered uninspired. I want to read you a quote from a, a classic work called Why? Subtitle, Suffering, Guilt, and God by Abraham Van de Beek. Listen to what he said. He said, we are bound by the sources of the Christian tradition of which Jesus Christ is the center. To become detached from these sources is to become detached from the Christian community. Christian faith cannot do without Jesus Christ or else it ceases to be Christian faith. And Jesus Christ can never be viewed apart from the tradition in which he stood and from the witness of the people around him who recognize him in the revelation of God. That is apart from the Old and New Testament scriptures. Here we find the critical norm in which our thinking, whatever our further orientation may be, we need to subject ourselves to. What we are told in the writings of the Old New Testament is decisive. It sets the tone for everything we want to say about God. And I hope to that statement you'd say, amen. This is decisive. Which means, B, it's inspired. God gave this. These are the words that God gave. You say, well, what about Paul saying this in those passages? I do not. I do not permit. Understand that in the wider context of the way Paul wrote his letters and how he addressed the churches. One of the things that you see consistently in all Paul's addresses to the people, to the churches, wherever he went around the world, was to identify himself as an apostle of God. He was making clear that the things he said carried apostolic authority. Why did he do that? He did that because he was unique among the other apostles in that he had not been around Christ before his crucifixion. All the other apostles had been with Jesus. They had been personally taught by Jesus. They had been in the fellowship company of Jesus. Paul's relationship with Jesus was unique because he was in the company and the fellowship and was taught by the resurrected Jesus. And so he says, I've been called an apostle also. So in each of these letters, he's establishing his authority, just like Peter's, just like John's, just like the apostles, apostolic authority, speaking for Christ as he spoke of Christ in the same way. So when Paul says, I do not permit, he's not saying, guys, hey, this is just my opinion. If I were there, this is how I would do it. If I were pastoring your church, if I were leading in your community, I would apply it this way. What he's saying is, as an apostle of God, appointed by Christ Jesus himself, carrying the full weight of that authority, here is what we must not, cannot, and I do not permit. This is inspired by God. And number three, remember what he wrote to Timothy. Because of these things... Because it's a message of God to us, it's inspired by him, and it's God's words, not Paul's, it's profitable. It's profitable. When I was putting my notes together this week, one of the first things I did in the top corner of the page is I listed what I thought were pastoral concerns. Pastoral concerns. Our people. Us right here, me and you. The Calvary family faith. This body of believers here. What's necessary for this text for us? And I wrote down some of these thoughts. If you have some room in your notes somewhere or on the back of your hand or wherever you want to write them, write these down. One is unity. One of the reasons we teach the scriptures is so we would be unified around them. There's certainly plenty that Satan could seize upon to disrupt unity, to bring about discord. One thing every Christian ought to find unity in is the revelation of God in his word. Can we come to agreement here and say this is what God has said to us, unity? Second concern is that we would have healthy, God-honoring worship. Since this is addressed to people in worship, the church gathered, it speaks to how we worship. Are we doing it, doing it in a way that the scriptures prescribe? Is God pleased with it? Is this what God wanted? Because we believe fully that we are not able, we don't have the authority, when I say we're not able, I mean we don't have the right to, determine how we're going to worship on our own apart from scripture it's regulated scripture tells us god tells us how he will be worshiped so having god honoring worship a third pastoral concern is this i want the passage and i want what i say to you to be encouraging particularly if you're a woman today i want you to know what the bible says and doesn't say and i want there to be some encouragement here to you of what your role and participation needs to look like and can look like in the body of believers number four i want to give some exhortation to men now, I intentionally shifted those words. Women, I want you to be encouraged to step up in the roles that God has afforded you and participate in the life that God has offered you in his, in his church. Men, I want to challenge you to step up, to play the man, 
to be the person God wants you to be, to do the things that God has uniquely prescribed for you. And so I want to do both of those things. Next, I want to do this. I want you to write this word down if it's an unfamiliar term to you. If it is a familiar term to you, then you'll know what I'm talking about. I want us to increasingly be developing a healthy hermeneutic. I know it sounds like a, a, a cheesy sort of scholarly word. Hermeneutic simply means the means by which we interpret Scripture. So when we read it, what's the lens that we see it through? What's the method that we employ to say, what does this text say? What does this text mean for me? How do I live this? How do I do this? What hermeneutic, what tools do we use when we apply the Bible? The most frequent hermeneutic you probably would recognize is the hermeneutic of emotion. When I read this, this is how it makes me feel. Well, I feel like that's the hermeneutic of emotion. Sometimes we apply the hermeneutic of tradition. Well, I've always heard that, or I've always seen that, or in the churches I've been, we've always done. That's the hermeneutic of, of tradition. Sometimes we apply the hermeneutic of culture. You know, this is what people do everywhere. What is the, what is the right way of handling these scriptures? So we need to have a healthy hermeneutic. And next, I want us to establish a biblical worldview. You say, wait, you're getting all this from this text? Absolutely. You and I need to have the right view of the times in which we live, the struggles that we face. How do we answer them? How do we address them? How do we speak where we need to speak, act where we need to act, stand firm when we need to stand firm? How do we develop a healthy biblical worldview? Because we certainly, would you not agree, that we're certainly facing a crisis in our culture today when it comes to sex and gender roles, male and female, marriage and family? What does the Bible say? We need this worldview. Listen, it has been Satan's strategy since the very dawn of creation to disrupt God's good design in creation. I mean, you have to see that in the text. You go back to Genesis, and you see this utopia that God has made, the beauty of it, the pleasure of it, the relationship intrinsic to it between man and the God that made them. You see the perfect fellowship that God made between man and woman. It's not good that man should be alone, and God made for Adam a helpmate. And for the first time in creation, God says, it's very good. This is very good. And then sin enters in. And what was the essence of that first sin? You have the tempter, the serpent, identified in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, that old dragon, Satan. And what does he come in to do? He comes in to disrupt this good creation that God has made by first putting a wedge between man and woman, husband and wife disordering their fellowship, corrupting their relationship, undoing the order in which God had made, causing them to be at odds, causing conflict to ensue. This is what he's been doing from the very beginning. First, he attacks marriage, and then gender roles. What should a woman do? What should a man do? What was Adam's responsibility? What was Eve's? And now look what we see in our culture today, way downstream from that. If Satan has been doing this since the beginning to undo what God did that was good so that he might make it bad, corrupting it and destroying it, hurting all the people along the way, is it any wonder that we are where we are to now, where we are now in our current culture when it comes to sex, gender, marriage, and all those things? Carl Truman wrote a book that I would put on your must-read list, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. This came out last year. In his book, he writes in the introduction this. And listen to his statement. And if this is enough to pick your curiosity so that you go order the book, then good. He said, the origin of this, of this book lie in my curiosity about how, how and why a particular statement has come to be regarded as coherent and meaningful. Here's the statement. I am a woman trapped in a man's body. How did that come to be a coherent and meaningful statement in the culture in which we live? He says... My grandfather died in 1994, less than 30 years ago. And yet, had he ever heard that sentence uttered in his presence, I have little doubt that he would have burst out laughing and considered it a piece of incoherent gibberish. And yet today, it's a sentence that many in our society regard not only as meaningful, but so significant that to deny it or question it in some way is to reveal oneself as stupid, immoral, or, subject to, or subject to yet another irrational phobia. And those who think of it as meaningful are not restricted to the veterans of college seminars on queer theory or French post-structuralism. They're just ordinary people. And for the next several hundred pages, he goes about addressing how did our culture get to the point 
where the average Joe in the street, the average student in the high school classroom, and people across our cultural span accept that sort of thinking as normative. It's the attack of Satan on everything that God made good, and it starts here. So you're saying, why is that important in this passage? Well, that's why this matters. You see, these are downstream issues, way downstream from that which is most upstream. What did God do in creation? Why did God do it? And so when we look at this passage and we see the role of women in the gathered church setting, to simply brush that aside as saying nothing important is somewhere midstream between what God did in creation and the sort of craziness and insanity that we see today that threatens the very freedoms of the church. If we don't protect our right way of thinking, if we don't go back to the headwaters and say, God, you are good in your creation. You're loving in your creation. What you have done is for our good and for our flourishing. It's so that we might find your blessing in this world and realize that the wrong sort of thinking wrongly applied all the way back in the first century church to today leads us to where we are. And that brings me to the last pastoral concern in the text. And yes, this is all intro, so buckle your seatbelt. This passage is about restoring God's good design. It's about bringing to restoration. That's what the gospel does. The gospel does more than just make sure that you, you have an eternal train ticket punched to heaven. The gospel does more than ensure that you are diverted from the pathway to eternal hell. It does that and so much more if it's received and believed. The gospel is about God's reordering of everything back to way, the way he intended. The new heavens and the new earth that are promised to those who are in Christ is about the full restoration of everything. And so what's at stake here is Satan's attack against God's created order. And what does the church do in response to display the glory of God and the goodness of what he's designed? To display God's right way of things so that we flourish, so that we thrive together. That's presupposition number one. Presupposition number two. This passage applies specifically to the gathered church. That's the context of the writing. That's what Timothy is addressing. Remember we saw this in verse 8. That was just last week. If you're wondering if I was going to connect the two, yes, I am. He says, I desire that in every place that men should pray. Remember what he said? He says, I want you to pray. I want you to be able to pray with holy hands lifted without anger or quarreling. Well, what was he talking about? When the church gathers together, when the body is assembled, this is disruptive. Men, you're bringing your conflicts and your quarreling into the gathered body of Christ, and you're disrupting worship for us all. When you come to worship, your hearts need to be right. You need to be able to address God with holy hands, not with all this quarreling conflict. Men, fix that. Likewise, women. The context is very clear. It's in every place that the church gathers. It's what we would call the local church. And we know this is exactly what Paul wrote to Timothy about in chapter 3. I hope to come to you soon, he said. But I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church, the living God, church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. What's the hub of the wheel of Paul's letter to Timothy? Chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, that you might know how Christians ought to live together and worship together. So this is the context, the gathered church. Number three, third presupposition. This passage is hermeneutically, I gave you that word just a minute ago and then I slaughtered it, this passage is hermeneutically tricky, and you have to interpret it in light of other scripture. What do I mean by hermeneutically tricky? Well, right off the bat, it throws you a curve, right? Women are saved how? According to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Women are saved through what? Say it with me. Childbearing. What? Does that mean women are not saved by grace through faith? And this not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast? Because you can be pretty boastful about some successful childbearing, can't you? Look at these kids. Look what I've done. No, it's not about that. So we have to interpret that through other scriptures that are very clear and plain. One obscure verse or one difficult verse or one verse that we don't understand upon a quick reading doesn't undo hundreds of verses that we understand very clearly and plainly. So we dig a little deeper. What does that mean? We're going to come to that in just a minute. And number four, it is unlikely that we will agree on every interpretation or application or implication of these texts. It's unlikely. The reason I say it's unlikely is I could show you a stack of books on my desk right now of scholars, most of whom are upstanding and respectable, that disagree on the subject, at least to some degree. 
some in the nuances, some around the edges, some right down the center of the text. If Christians have not always agreed, it's unlikely that you and I would necessarily agree on everything. But even as I say that, that's not to let you off the hook and say whatever you want to believe about this passage and whatever you want to do with it is fine. Do with it whatever you will. That's not okay. We have to think biblically on this and every issue, not just culturally. Some of the things I'm going to say will punch the way our culture thinks right between the eyes. And in so doing, we'll punch some of you right between the eyes. But we can't just think culturally. We can't just think traditionally. What do I mean by that? Are you saying tradition on this subject is wrong? No, I'm saying often church tradition, particularly in our denominational tradition, has been very right on this text. I'm saying the problem with, with that traditional uh, interpretation, or no, no, let me back up. The problem with thinking traditionally is this. Without a biblical foundation, you'll just come off as a bigot. You know, I could pull some of you in this room, and I could probably most easily do this with men. And I'm not asking, this is not a poll, this is in your head poll. Men, how many of you are okay with gay marriage? Men, how many of you are okay with turning on TV and you're watching the football game on a Saturday and a commercial comes on and it's two men in a passionate embrace? How many of you are okay with that? And almost all of you, hopefully all of you, would say, no, no, I'm not okay with that. But for many of us, the only reason we're not okay with that is because it makes you angry or because it's gross or because, man, nobody used to do that. All those things are true, perhaps. But we have a deeper reason than saying this is just the way it is, right? No, God made things this way from creation, and his word says so. So how do we think biblically about this? Not just, well, that's how my grandfather would have thought. I think my grandfather probably thought right on this issue, but probably not for biblical reasons. I want to know what, what God thinks. I want to know what God gives. And, oh, this is the big one. We have to think biblically and not just emotionally. Because you're going to tempted to say, I don't like how that makes me feel. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't like that you said that. that. That stirs me. I get it. So for today, as we think about how to apply this, I'm going to focus on what I think is the clearest, most obvious application. The least possible gray of any of this. It's when the church gathers. I'm not dealing with the edges and the nuances of Things like relationships and friendships and women talking to men or small groups and conversations that, that take place in those. And yes, I know that there's justification in Scripture. Women are seen teaching men in Scripture, sometimes very important contexts. Like we know Priscilla and her husband Aquila. There were two co-laborers with Paul. We know that they instructed the way of God more clearly, more fully to Apollos. We know that. In Acts chapter 18, we saw that. We know also that in Paul's letter to Timothy, part 2, he talks about his own spiritual heritage. And it's not Paul's father or grandfather that instructed him in the faith. It was his mother and his grandmother. And apparently they were very successful. So we're going to keep it between these lines. What does God say those roles and responsibilities are when the church comes together to worship? The body of Christ gathered like we're doing today. Number five, this is a fifth presupposition. This passage is important to our practice, but it's not essential to the gospel. It's important to our practice, but it's not essential to the gospel. These are two classic errors that people make, so hear me out. For people who are very liberal in their take on Scripture, their interpretation of Scripture and scriptural truths, every doctrine is questionable. Every doctrine is up for debate. For people who are very fundamentalist, every doctrine has the same level of importance, and everyone is a hill to be died on for. You and I have to be willing to practice theological triage. You, you know the concept of triage, right? You know, if you end up in the emergency room tonight, you're probably going to be treated at least as those medical professionals can perceive in levels of importance. You know, if I come in there yelling and screaming because I caught a BB in my thigh, I'm probably not going to be treated with the same importance as a person having a heart attack or having a baby. You follow what I'm saying? We'll triage. We'll do the most important things first. Well, spiritually, you and I need to triage also. While we're challenged, we're commanded to contend for the faith in every generation. The faith, once and for all, delivered to the saints. That's what Jude verse 3 says. We have to figure out which parts are most critical that are absolutely hills to die on. I would give 
this sort of order. If you were with me on Wednesday night, you heard me give this order. I'll say as Christians, we need to understand what first order doctrines are. Those things which are make or break when it comes to the gospel itself. Things that we absolutely have to believe. First order doctrines are essential to the gospel itself. These are things like the virgin birth of Christ, the physical death of Christ on a cross, the bodily resurrection of Christ. These are non-negotiables. If someone disagrees on a first order doctrine, they are not Christian. Those are non-Christian beliefs. But then there are also second order doctrines. Second order doctrines are, are urgent for the health and life of a church. And sometimes... As they're applied, they might cause Christians to separate at the level of local church or denomination or ministry. I'll give you an example. Churches have to decide, will we ordain women as pastors or will we not? I mean, either you will or you won't. And in most cases, that separates denominations. Third order doctrines are things that are important to Christian theology. They're certainly important things, and we ought to come to a, an understanding of what's true about them. But they shouldn't justify separation among Christians. What you believe about the millennium, for instance, shouldn't separate Christians. Christians ought to be able to have healthy debate. Am I dispensational in my approach to the end times? Am I amillennial? Am I postmillennial? We ought to be able to have these debates and consider the scriptures in them. And they ought not separate us. And then fourth level things are things that frankly just really don't matter for us. We can decide what we think or what we believe, but they don't really have a, an impact on anything that we do together. So you, you and I have to develop this sort of tiered system of understanding. And so I would say liberalism, again, it treats every doctrine like it's third order. Everything's debatable. Everything's up for grabs. Fundamentalism, treat, fundamentalism treats every doctrine like it's first order. I say all that to say you can disagree about women's roles and still be a Christian. But it's still a critical issue for how this church functions and any biblical church functions. Churches have to make decisions about these things. Let's pray. Father, open our hearts and minds to reveal what you're saying to us. Father, by your spirit and by our own intentional efforts, I pray that we will leave preconceived notions and, and feelings and emotions behind. And Lord, with an open heart, open mind, say, God, speak to me through your word and your spirit. Show me the truth that I might live in a way that's pleasing to you. And Father, make our church as healthy as possible, more and more and more. Conform us to your word, to the teachings of your word that we might rightly represent Christ in this world. And Father, may we love one another well, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When Paul writes this text, he is shattering stereotypes. And when I say shattering stereotypes, I, I don't mean modern ones. I'm talking about ancient ones. You know, historically we'll see that the position of women, the treatment of women, the value of women was very different in the first century. If you came from a pagan background, if you came from a Jewish background, even in the early days of Christian background, it had to be addressed. And so it's really, it's really shattering those stereotypes. It speaks to the culture that they were in. In the Roman world, women were second-class citizens in terms of property rights, in terms of education, um, in, in terms of participation in, in any government or economy. Um, they were also considered to be academically inferior, and efforts at educating them were not expended. Um, in the Jewish world of the first century, it was similar. According to Jerusalem Talmud, quote, it would be better for the words of Torah, that's God's law, to be burned than that they should be entrusted to a woman. The Babylonian Talmud explains the difference between men and women when they gathered to worship. The men came to learn, the women came to hear. That was the mindset. So when Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about a woman learning and about a woman engaging, that was shattering to those stereotypes. God is engaging that. So I'm going to look at some critical issues in the text just very, very simply. Before I do, I want to say these two things as introductions still. One is this. The more I studied this text, the more I delved into it this week, the more I realized that the text itself is not that difficult. It's, it's our submitting to the text that's far more difficult. The text is actually pretty straightforward, pretty clear-cut. And for the first century audience that Paul is addressing, it would have been pretty well assumed. The second thing I would say to you is this. If what I share with you today, if what I say to you from this message today spurs you, it incites you to go read and to go study and to dig in more and find out more, then that would be a win. Because, again, this is a deep, deep subject with many implications, and it permeates lots of scriptures. And I'm trying to reduce a lot of different concepts into a 
sermon size window. So I can't necessarily cover them all, and I would encourage you to go and learn. You know, maybe this is an appropriate analogy. You wouldn't call your physician up and say, hey, can we have lunch Friday? And then you sit down with them, you know, at the Waffle House and say, hey, tell me about all that medical school stuff. I've been, I've been, I've been wanting to learn that stuff. I've got like half an hour. You, you wouldn't call up a musician and say, hey, Friday morning, can you teach me how to play the piano? Right? You wouldn't sit down with a professor at the university and say, you know, I know you've been in school for 12 years, but can you teach me some of that academic stuff real quick? I got like a, I, I, I got a call with a friend in 20 minutes. I know he's going to ask me some questions. Tell me about Western civilization. You know, again, I'm not saying I'm the one to sit with. I'm saying the scriptures are, and it's worth digging into. So there's three critical issues in the text. Let's do them, and I'm going to do them rather quickly. Number one, first issue in the text is a woman's appearance. So yes, I'm going to go there, okay? The text does. And you saw what the text says. I mean, again, let's revisit the words. Women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. Circle the word respectable. With modesty, circle modesty. Self-control, circle self-control. Not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but that which is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So let's look at the anchor words. The anchor words there are respectable, modesty, self-control, godliness. And then he gives some, some applications of those things. So what Paul is not doing here is saying you can't wear pearls. Anybody wearing pearls today? Stand up. No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. No braided hair, no gold. No, this is not a comprehensive across the board saying these are things. This is not legalism. This is not a rigid fundamentalism. He's using examples to talk about the larger points here of a woman's adornment, how a person dresses, a woman's attire, again, in, in worship. What does this look like? In worship, I'll give you three questions to evaluate yourself. Is what I wear ostentatious? Ostentatious. Is it, does, am I wearing this so that I can display my wealth? So I can display my social class? So I can display my superiority? You know, that was certainly common in, in the first century. I know that's not common today, right? No one does that, right? No one is concerned about name brands, labels, styles, types, any of those kind of things. What the word is saying, in Christian worship, those things that separate us for those kind of reasons harm us. Why would we do that? When the purpose of our gathering together is to affirm our oneness in Christ, that we are brothers and sisters together, and that we span this continuum all the way from slave to free, rich and poor, in every color on the scale that we are one in Christ, why would we focus on those things which say, I'm better than you, I'm different than you? We wouldn't. So it's what I wear ostentatious. Now here's one you're not going to like. I get it. It's what I wear provocative. It's what I wear provocative. Now I'm going to go way out on this limb, and I hope I don't saw it off for myself while I'm out at the end of it. But I know it is fashionable today, and I use that word pun intended, I know it's fashionable today, to blame men for any lustful glance, any appropriate thought, any lingering look. And for women to claim, if men do that, that's all on them. But that's not how we're made. That's not how we're wired. And I'm not justifying the backward glance or the lingering look or the lustful look. I'm simply saying, women, you have a responsibility to your brothers and sisters that how you dress doesn't contribute to that that we don't need to be thinking about that. Wow, her skirt is too short. Wow, her neckline is too low. Why is she wearing that? Why is she dressed like that? Paul addresses that clearly. Is what I'm wearing having an effect on my brothers and sisters? And it may not be so raw or base as saying, I don't want to think of them undressing me with their eyes or lusting over me. No, maybe it's just simply a distraction. Maybe the focus is just there and it's not where it ought to be. I mean, again, think of the context here for a moment. What did he say that men were doing to disrupt the worship. What were men doing? They were arguing and quarreling. Men don't do that, right? That's not something men do. They don't ever get into arguments or debates. He's saying, men, stop being, stop being guys that are just fighting over stuff. Come together in Christ so that when we worship, we can raise our hands and have holy hands before God. That's what a man might be doing to disrupt the fellowship. What might a woman be doing? When she walks in and how she dresses, he's addressing these things. And maybe to get to the heart of it, Maybe we should look more to the motive and less to the outward expression. Because maybe some of it's just done in ignorance, I get. And certainly some of it's done to be reflective of the culture that we live in. And we just don't know the difference. 
So the question goes to the heart. What's the motive of my appearance? Ask yourself that. Ask yourself that. When, when I get up and I'm getting dressed and I'm looking in the mirror, what's the motive here? What's the motive? And ask God to check the heart because that's what he's talking about. He said, this is an issue. You've got to subject your sense of personal freedom for the needs of this group, for this body. Because your brothers and sisters matter. And how we worship together matters. So subject yourselves to that. Subject your freedoms and your preferences and things for the good of the body. First issue is appearance. Second issue is a woman's attitude. A woman's attitude when the church gathers. Again, the word quietly is repeated at the end of verse 12. Quietly. Now, quiet is a much better translation than some of you have in your Bible, which uses the word silent. Because the word is not silent. It's the same word that we see earlier. Verse 2. The kind of life God wants us to live. Quiet, peaceful. This this attitude word. Quietness in this passage doesn't mean that you sit silent in the gathered church. It doesn't mean you can't ever say a word. It doesn't mean that you can't read a scripture or pray a prayer. As we saw in 1 Corinthians, it doesn't mean that there can't be a prophetic word spoken for the good of the people there. What it speaks of is this attitude, this respectful engagement with those who are teaching. Now, now let, me, let me clarify this just for a moment. When I say respectful engagement, we know a couple of things. One, we know that the teaching in the church both described and prescribed, was to be done by the elders. All right, this is a teaching ministry of the elders. We know that in the scriptures, those elders were universally and are universally male. That's the biblical pattern. So the teaching he's talking about is the specific teaching of the word. We would call it the preaching, the preaching of the word done by those male elders. And again, to clarify, he's not saying, women, you don't get to ask any questions Women, you have to accept everything that's being said to you without discernment. Women, that passage about being Bereans to make sure that you're hearing if what is said is true doesn't apply to you. It's not that. It's not blind, unthinking, uncritical concession. It's the sort of listening that honors the word and those that God has called to teach it. Consider Acts 20, verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Elders who teach the word have been given a task and a responsibility by God to be overseers. Honor that and that that teaching. And understand that in a healthy, biblically functioning church, that voice, that voice of the overseer, that voice of the elder will not be a solitary voice. It will not be one person speaking opinion unchecked. We're having an elders meeting this Wednesday. I said, guys, be ready. I'm speaking on women Sunday. Here's the text. You know what's up next. And, of course, they're going to want to know, are you going to say anything crazy that we got to fix or correct or handle? I'm just going to deal with the straightforward nature of the text. But if I do say something that's biblically untrue, theologically untenable, practically offensive, whatever it may be, then I have more than your emails to contend with. I have a group of peers who also are charged with overseeing the health and life of the church and the administration of the word. And we'll talk about those things and where correction is necessary, correction will come. We know that multiple elders in every church is God's good design for reasons just like this. Acts 14, 23. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, plural elders, every church, that was the norm, that was the pattern. Acts 20, 17. He sent to Ephesus, called the elders of the church, plural, elders of the church in Ephesus to come to him. Well, what about if a church doesn't have enough men, enough qualified men? Because the Bible's pretty clear on who qualifies, who doesn't. Well, if you don't have enough, what do you do then? You work to get them. Because when you get to Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says this, put what remains into order. How do you put this into order? How do you get this thing up to the standard, the bar that God has set? You appoint elders in every town, as I directed you. That's for your good in passages like this. So it's that idea of of being submissive to the text, being submissive to the word, being submissive to those who lead. It's the attitude. Not to be contentious, not to be argumentative, but to respond to it in a humble way. Paul deals with this a little bit more when he writes his letter to the Corinthians. Respecting the authority of your own home structure and the leadership of your own husband, that that's the first place that you should go. 
That's the first place you should go with those questions and, and things. Well, what does this mean? How do we do this? What did he, did he, is what he said correct? That priest of your own home is that first person that you should go to. Remember I said I want to encourage women I also, and I want to exhort men? Man, you need to be able to answer those texts. You need to be able to sit down with your family and say, let's talk about what the word says here and what this means for us. So it's attire, it's attitude, and number three, it's authority. Authority is a critical issue in this text, ultimately. This is the part we probably struggle with the most. Maybe attire than authority, authority or, or attire, I'm not sure. Simply put, in the gathered church, women are encouraged like everyone else. Also made in the image of God. Also valuable to him. Also the same worth of every person in the room, male or female. They're encouraged to learn. But they're not permitted to teach or have authority over men. That's clearly what he said. Now the reason why is, is twofold. Okay, so I hope I gave you just enough so you would dispense with the idea that this was just Paul's idea. And get a sense from scripture that this was the common practice of the church, both as described and the practice as prescribed. But the reason is that to teach and to gather church entails the authority of scripture. You've heard us say this before in regard to elders in the church. What sort of authority do elders have in a church like ours? It's not the authority of their elected position or office. It's the authority of the scriptures so that the role of elders is to teach. That's primary. That's number one, to teach. And to teach and challenge the church to be obedient to the scriptures. Even Paul himself followed this model. As the church finally began to grow and develop and elders were being put in place and church structures were there, what did Paul do when there was a gross sin in the church in Corinth, for instance? I mean, this is Paul. He's the authority of an apostle. He's the author of more New Testament scripture than anyone. He tells the church what you ought to do as Christians according to the word. That's the authority. So when he's, he's talking about authority, he's talking about the authority of the taught word. When the church gathers... It's gathering around the authority of Scripture. When someone teaches, it's the authority of Scripture. And again, that role is reserved for male. Both the office of elder and the function of elder, they're reserved for males. When the job descriptions are given, it's for males. When the pattern is followed, it's for males. When we see the names in Scripture, it's for males. This is God's design. 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of honor, double honor, especially those who labor in preaching or teaching. Now, when he says women ought to submit to this teaching and this authority, he's not saying that all men are to teach all women. This is not a universal statement that in every conversational setting, every teaching setting, all men are always above all women. And all men ought to always be teaching all women. The office of teaching in the church is a very narrow lane. And those who teach are clearly held to a higher standard. Many, plenty of men are not qualified to be taught, uh, teachers of the word according to scripture. So it's not all men to all women, nor does the scripture say that all women are to submit to all men. Men, you don't get to flex in church or when you're sitting in your life group and think that woman across the aisle who's not your wife has to submit to you. She does not. That's not what this is about. Rather, these verses teach that all women are to submit to the teaching and discipline of the pastors and elders of the church. That's the role. Now, obviously... There's something contextual in this as well. This is not written in a vacuum. Paul wasn't just writing things like, hey, should this ever come up? You might want to know this. Obviously, there was context there. Obviously, you had in this culture where pagans were becoming Christians, and they once were exerting pagan rites and pagan sorts of worship that allowed them to do whatever and play whatever roles, say whatever words, use whatever incantations, that now they're repeating that in the Christian church. He's saying, no, no, that's not the order of Christian worship. That's not the order of God's creation which should be reflected in worship. So yeah, there's a context he's addressing. But just because there was this context in which this applies doesn't mean that it's only about that context. You and I have a similar context that we, we have to apply it in, our particular context. Now, the rationale is because the authority is the word. But the basis is this, and this is where it gets heavy, but critical. The basis for this prohibition is God's good design and creation itself. That's how we know that this wasn't just Ephesus. This wasn't just that culture or that time. This wasn't just women who two months ago worshipped in the temple of Diana 
where the goddess Diana reigned supreme as a chief deity of the city. The root of this is not Ephesus, first century. It's creation from the very beginning. By virtue of the order of creation, God has given Adam an authority and a responsibility that he, by his own sovereign will, for his own good purposes, decided not to give Eve. This is the order in which God put things in. This is the design. And so when we see Paul writing about marriage, for instance, in Ephesians, we see him reflecting the, God, uh, the good design of God's created order. Uh, when we see Paul writing to the Romans about sin, particularly sexual sin, we see him not appealing to Roman culture, which was marked by utter debauchery. We see him appealing to creation. How did God make you? Male and female, he created you. And when we see God talking about order in the church and men and women, he doesn't appeal to the times. He doesn't appeal to the struggles. And he doesn't appeal to the context they came out of. He says, let me tell you how I made you. And I made you this way for a reason. This is my design. And I gave to Adam a responsibility to care for and to lead. And I gave to Eve a responsibility to love and to support and to encourage. And when you do things in the way in which I created you to do them, you will flourish like this. You will benefit like this. And then Satan steps in, and the first thing he does is try to undo it. Did God really say? Is that really good? Is this how you really want it? And so he begins the attack at Eve. This passage also speaks to the intrinsic differences between men and women. Let me just lay this out here for a moment. And I don't have a lot of time to explain, but just give me the time to finish. This passage speaks to intrinsic differences between men and women and the implications of those differences in this context, the context of the church. Is it any wonder today that so much of our cultural struggle is trying to blur the lines, if not erase them completely, of any distinctions between men, men and women? I mean, do we not see this everywhere? I mean, on my phone, I can send you an emoji right now of a pregnant man. I mean, it's, if, if it wasn't so tragic, it would be comical. Imagine me standing here three years ago and saying, here's my prediction. In 2022, I'll be able to send you an emoji of a guy, short hair, clearly male, having a baby. I'll be able to send you pictures of people who declare that they're women now, and we're supposed to accept them as that, and, and, and they'll be serving in our government, and they'll be leading our health care in America. I, I'll be able to send you people claiming that is biological men, which is a phrase I refuse to use. You're male or female. And they're having menstrual periods. Sorry, kids and parents, I don't want to be uh, PG-13. That These things are ludicrous that we're living. How did we get here? Because Satan in his grand strategy of undoing God's good, wants to eliminate male and female. A popular documentary, at least in the right side of our culture, what is a woman? What is a woman today? And, and we can't define that. And now you see people posting on their social media with their preferred pronouns. Listen, I'm not just here to rant. I'm saying, how did we get here? How did we get so far downstream that now we refuse to define what a man or woman is, We've lost our definition of marriage, which by God's design, who made it, not mankind, is a man and a woman together for a lifetime. We've lost that already. We're losing our distinctions on sex and gender that you can be, as Carl Truman notes, a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa, and all these things. And we're treating children now for this. How did we get here? Because we lost the sense of what God made from the beginning. And that is spiritual warfare. That's part of Satan's grand design. I will break this thing that God has made. I will do everything I can to destroy those that he made in his image. I will wreck the world that they live in. I will wreak havoc in their families. I will disrupt their marriages. I will undo their governments. I will bring pain and suffering and discord and destruction. And I will make it as painful and as long-lasting as I can. And it starts with things like this. You say, I don't think that's an important text. Women speaking in church. I do. I do because it speaks to what God has designed and will we affirm it or not. Professor Dar uh, Daniel Doriani has written extensively on this passage, and I want to read you something that he said. He says, Men lead in home and church because God desired and ordered creation. He sovereignly chose to order it through male headship, a headship given to them without a view to any merit on their part. In other words, he didn't say, Men, you're smarter, you're better. No, he said, This is how we're going to do it. 
He says, yet God established a coherence or congruence between his decree and his creation. God shaped the minds, the proclivities, and perhaps even the bodies of humans to reflect his decree. God made you this way completely. It's part of who you are. Who your body shows you that you are, you are. And part of this is all part of his design. He didn't do it absent from that. He didn't make us interchangeable in our roles. He didn't say some roles are more valuable than others. But he said these roles are essential to your flourishing and they're not exchangeable. Doriani says this, and, and you tell me if, if this plays out in your life and your relationships. He says women tend to what he calls enmeshment. You ever heard the term enmeshment? He said enmeshment is an unwillingness to see and condemn harsh truths about loved ones. He says, women generally have more interest in persons and less interest in detached, rational analysis of ideas. And he says, I understand we can risk being too generalistic, paint with too broad of a brush. But is it not true that men can more easily engage and dispense with the fact that you and I might be close friends, or we might be siblings even, and deal with the topic at hand? Maybe to our wrong. No, he says it this way. He says, men tend to forget the heretic before them is also their neighbor. They have a greater willingness to disagree openly. He says, perhaps by God's design, he made men more apt to guard doctrine and condemn error as a result. Does that make sense in your life? I can see that in my world. Cecilia sometimes, who grew up with a brother who's you know, 10 years, so functionally she's an only child. She didn't grow up with boys around her. I've got two older brothers, and we were fairly close in age growing up together. She doesn't understand sometimes that give and take, and sometimes that give and take can be kind of a lot of giving and a lot of taking. You know, we can go at e go to each other pretty hard. And then you can put it aside. There's just something about us that's different. We don't mind engaging our differences. We don't mind having a warm discussion about our differences. We don't mind holding passionately onto those things which we think are, are different. We will argue those things. We'll debate those things. Now, hopefully in Christ we're doing those things in love with a respect, but we don't mind engaging those things. Whereas she might say, you know, that's your brother. But that's your brother. I know, but he's wrong. No, but, you know, you just have to love him. Yeah, but he's an idiot. <laughs> and that's how we would talk. That's how we would engage. And I know it plays out even with our kids. Now, listen, I have to be careful what I, what I say here because I don't want you to interpret this wrongly nor it to be hurtful to anybody. I grew up in a single-parent home. My mom had to play dual roles. She had to be a mom and a dad because dad was not around. Thankfully, God in his wisdom and grace and sovereignty put some good men in my life. Most of those came from church, by the way. Had a godly neighbor lived across the street. And he was a father type figure and had some godly men in church who looked out for the widow and the orphan and took care of young guys like me and invested themselves. And I appreciate that. And that's God filling in the gap. That's God being a father to the fatherless, working through, through people. So I encourage you men, you know, those of you who work with children and students or those of you who don't yet, pour into the lives of those single moms and their kids. But I know it was hard for her to play both those roles. And I'm reminded constantly in the life of my own children growing up and parenting them now in young adulthood, which is considerably harder than parenting them in young life. So if you parents with little kids think your life's all hard, no, it's not. It's going to get a lot worse. Um, <laughs> it's going to get a lot more challenging. But they need both voices. They need both voices. They need both responses. They, they need to hear from both perspectives. They need to hear from the dad perspective and the mom perspective. And God designed it that way. And it's not always exactly the same. It's not exactly the same way of handling these. Doriani said, God has etched traces of his sovereign decree concerning male leadership into the nature of men and women. These reflections of his decree allow men to seek leadership more readily and allow women to follow them. That's I know that's countercultural. I, I know I would get lit up on Twitter to post that. But the argument is not culture nor preference. And if anyone would argue the opposite, it would be me. I grew up in a home with a very strong mom and a weak absentee dad. But God's good design is this. And I have to trust that God's good design is good for me. Now, there are two potentially confusing verses I want to clarify. I know the time. Just stick with me. Every now and then we've got to do this. Verse 14. Is Paul throwing Eve under the bus completely? Is he absolving Adam of any responsibility in the deal? Is he saying, look, because this is the way our emotions might interpret it and our superficial reading might suggest, whoa, listen to the man because woman, women, you blew it. <laughs> This world is in its wrecked state because it's Eve. It wasn't Adam. That's not what he's saying here. In fact, that's actually the opposite of what he's saying. Rather than blaming Eve, this passage is teaching that God held Adam responsible that day. 
It says, Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. Did you catch that? Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. In God's estimation, who then was more at fault? Satan came and said the right things. He, he twisted the words enough, and he got Eve to believe it. But there's no sense in the text and no interpretation of the text from Genesis 3 in 1 Timothy 2 that Adam was similarly deceived, which means that he consciously chose that. He wasn't deceived about what he was doing. He knew full well what he was doing. And what he had done in allowing Eve to succumb to that temptation was abdicating the responsibility he had been given by God to be her protector. Satan's distortion of creation happens when man abdicates the authority that God has given him and a woman assumes it. God had put Adam in place and Eve at his side. And where was Adam when the temptation took place? And why was he not protecting his wife? Why was he not snatching her away from this? And why was he not shutting down the serpent? He had abdicated, even then. And Eve had, Eve had stepped in, and the corruption began. And so that's what the passage is talking about. It's not saying, hey, men, you're free, you're free of responsibility or culpability. You didn't do it, Eve did it. No, no, no. Men, you did something worse. Why did you allow that to happen, Adam? You weren't fooled. You chose it. You did it. And what about verse 15, where he talks about redemption? This is actually the beautiful gospel-centered portion of this passage. Think big picture here for a moment. What happened in the garden? God's good design was corrupted. Eden was abandoned. No, they were cast out of it and could not reenter it. They had irreparably broken what God had done and could not undo it. They could not restore it on their own. And now this fellowship they had with God was broken because of sin. And not just Adam and Eve, because the New Testament makes clear that they set a pattern biologically, spiritually, for every human that followed. Now we're born into this sin nature. We're born in this corrupted state. And now by nature and by choice, we're sinners just like them. By one man, sin entered into the world. And death from sin. And death passed upon all men. Because now all have sinned, and that's the condition. What do you do now? Do you see the big picture here, the gospel? Here's ruined creation because of man, and it can't be undone. What regret, what pain, what remorse to think what could have been, how we could have enjoyed God, how we could have enjoyed this world, how we could have enjoyed our spouses, how we could have enjoyed all the blessings of God. But we chose something else. What will we do? And God brings about the gospel from the very beginning. In Genesis 3, verse 15, he describes the work of this serpent. It's going to bruise your heel. He'll be attacking. He'll be doing everything he can to destroy. But you will crush his head through childbirth. Through childbirth, God will bring about the salvation of his people? Yes, he will. God, by his grace, instead of bringing the death that sin deserves, God, by his grace, brings about the possibility of life. If you'll trust in his plan. He says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll crush your head and you'll strike his heel. But then when we get to Romans 16, we see that God is undoing that curse. Hebrews chapter 2 describes the Jesus who paid the penalty for that curse. And Revelation chapter 20 describes the ultimate judgment of the serpent who initiated that curse. And it's all through Christ. So the idea of redemption, the redemption from the fall and the undoing of the curse of sin... It's through childbearing. And that's a unique blessing that God has given women. Is it painful? Apparently. I can't say. Because here's a radical statement. Men can't have babies. <laughs> but it's a blessing to them. And it's the blessing of God that saves creation. That's what it's talking about. And it's specifically the birth of Christ. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that they might receive adoption as sons. So when he says women will be saved through childbirth, he's saying this is how God's going to undo the curse brought about by Adam and Eve. You're going to give birth, and ultimately that birth is going to be a son, and he's going to be the son of God, born of woman, for the salvation of all. That's the good news of God. And this brokenness, God provides a cure. And one day God's going to restore everything as he sees fit. And the idea in verse 15 of will be saved, it doesn't mean your salvation is up in the air, uncertain, that you can't know with certainty. It's the idea of perseverance. 
just persevering. Let's do things the right way for as long as we have breath to breathe until, until he returns. And by this, by doing things the right way, we're reordering what has been broken. We're reordering it. We're putting it back together. We're saying God has a plan and a purpose that's for our good. I don't normally quote this much of a sermon from another pastor, but it was so meaningful to me that I thought, so simple, so profound. John Piper said, manhood and womanhood mesh better in ministry when men take primary responsibility for leadership and teaching in the church. Manhood and womanhood are better preserved and better nurtured and more fulfilled and more fruitful in the church order than in any other order. This is how it works best. And why? That's what he says. This is the way the scriptures teach us to order the church. God inspired the scriptures. And God is good. If you and I could get our minds around this ultimate truth, it starts here. God is good. God's creation is good. God's creation of men and women in that order is very good. His design is good. His design in marriage, his design in gender, his design in roles, responsibilities. God didn't assign different values. He didn't say one is made in my image and one is not. He didn't describe different levels of worth or responsibility or freedom. He didn't describe different means of salvation or different enjoyment in salvation. But in the functioning of things, God did describe and prescribe a different ordering of things, a structure, a plan, a purpose, and it was for good. And when I say for good, I mean always. And it was for good. And when I say for good, I mean for our good, for our benefit, for our blessing. So why do we care about these things? Because we trust that God's word prescribes for us what God desires. What God's desire is good for us, for the world, for the church. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for your word. I pray that, Father, I've not introduced confusion. But, Father, open the door for understanding and clarity and right sort of conversation. And, Father, I pray that the things we share would have meaningful pastoral benefit, healthy benefit to our people, both in the order of our homes and the, and the role and responsibility that God has called men to perform. And in the church, God, that you'd be honored here. Father, I, it seems increasingly that the right ordering of your church in every way and all the things we're trying to do and be faithful to your word in is so countercultural. And it's not just counter to the world's culture anymore. Father, forgive us for it is often countercultural to the church culture that we live in today. So, Father, help us to rightly place your truths in order. Father, may we not dispense with anything, dismiss anything that's important and necessary and critical. May we take your word as our definitive, um, timeless, absolute measurement of truth and practice and ever be conforming ourselves to it in every regard. Father, even while we do, I pray that we would recognize that there are some things that Christians may disagree on and there are some things that churches have to decide on. There are some things we just have to do if we're going to be faithful to you. And Lord, I pray that that would be our priority above all things. God, are you pleased with us? Is this what you wanted for us to do? And Father, we'll trust you in the results and process. Lord, I pray that in this fellowship that we'd be more and more like Jesus. I pray we love each other well. I pray your word would be the guide that speaks of you and what you'd have us to do. I pray we would encourage each other and I pray we'd be unified around its teachings. And I pray that you would make this unique community of people who love one another and care for each other well, male and female, rich and poor, young and old, black or white, whatever our human status may be, that we love each other well as family, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I pray in the context of other passages that we would have women that would step up as spiritual mothers and spiritual grandmothers. I pray you would develop men and women alike who are women of prayer and women of the word who understand it, who can share it, people who teach the, the good news and share the gospel and encourage one another. And I pray you would raise up men to be healthy, functional, biblical elders who honor you and love this church and love, love your work. 
love the ministry to which you've called us, love the community in which you've placed us, and love even the challenges in front of us, Father. Make, make those things so of us. Father, find us faithful, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us?